A young mom with stage four cancer trying to survive while still caring for her newborn son. Coming up, her story of hope and the power of family as she faced a bleak diagnosis. Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell. Welcome to the Morning Medical Update. Doctors gave Stephanie File an 8% chance to live. An aggressive cancer was spreading and she didn't know if she would ever see her newborn son grow up. So Stephanie's father started a journal and that journal turned into a new book called Daddy's Girl by Michael Schnabel. It's a memoir of Stephanie's cancer diagnosis and her treatment. And we are happy to share this big spoiler alert that Stephanie survived and we are so glad that she is joining us live this morning alongside her father the author your story both of your story is really one of hope and faith so we thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story with us today and we're also joined by one of Stephanie's doctors Dr. Joaquina Baranda is a medical oncologist as well as the medical director of the early phase program at the University of Kansas Cancer Center good morning thank you good, good morning to, good to see you good to see you and talk with you today we have talked a lot on this program before about colon cancer becoming more and more common in younger adults. So Stephanie, let's go back to 2006. You were 27 years old, you were pregnant, and you started feeling symptoms of pain, you had rectal bleeding. Just tell us how bad was it and what did doctors first tell you? Um, in October of 2006, um, I was in my second trimester of being pregnant and I started having abdominal pain and rectal bleeding, as you stated, and um, it was just a shock. Of course, I was pregnant, and so it was even scarier at that point. Um, I went to the doctor, um, and they just said, oh, you know, you're just having maybe pregnancy symptoms. Um, kept um, pushing along. I was teaching at the time and um, was still having issues, and I just couldn't deal with the pain because the pain got to be so much. So they went ahead, um, I had my gestational diabetes test and my hemoglobin was an 11, went up to Nebraska for Thanksgiving and um, stopped nine times along the way. A uh, five and a half hour trip turned into a nine hour trip and um, had blood at every stop. And um, they got me back home on that Friday after Thanksgiving and uh, my hemoglobin had dropped two points and they couldn't do a full colonoscopy because it would have thrown me into labor. So they did a flex sig and found two polyps and a bleeding ulcer. Um, started me on different medications, started me on Miralax, started me on um, um, suppositories um, and just said, oh, you know, that's where the bleeding is coming from is you have a, you know, um, an ulcer that's bleeding, a couple polyps, no big deal, we'll scope you again as soon as you have the baby. Um, that turned into the next two months um, of just increasing pain and bleeding um, me not I was teaching and so I had to teach from a chair at the time I couldn't stand um, for long periods of time because of the pain um, had a went and saw a GI doc and he didn't take me seriously at all um, it was well it has to do with the pregnancy flat out asked could this be colon cancer and the answer was no you're 27 we don't see colon cancer in 27 years old year olds but um kept pushing the issue and um eventually they took the baby three weeks early and i had him the pain and the bleeding stopped and 11 days later i was hospitalized again with the pain and the bleeding and that's when they found the cancer I love what you said where you were telling me that you were having this bleeding through that long road trip and you just simply knew something was wrong. So you go to get help yeah. and then you think there's something more wrong. And when you heard it probably wasn't cancer, you pushed further for those answers. That is good. Um, you shared some baby photos. I, I got to show these. And Michael, what a, a huge mix of emotions. You celebrate the birth of your, your grandson here, but now you're faced with your daughter starting cancer treatment. Tell us what that was like for you. Well, we were terrified when we uh, found out the news that she had the colon cancer. Um, you know, her biggest issue was, uh, she was certainly afraid of dying, but her biggest issue was to stay alive for this newborn child. Uh, and that was the, the, the thing that really motivated her to go from a victim to turn into a warrior. 
but it was terrifying as a father. You know, you want to do everything that you can to protect your children and watch over them and take care of them. Steffi and I are incredibly close, and uh, she's always been a daddy's girl. And uh, so we just tried to do our best to go ahead and start moving forward, but it was very, very difficult in the beginning. Well, and I love that you put this picture of your baby girl right here on the, because this is kind of how you always see your kid, isn't it? She here's, She's a mom yeah. giving birth to her, her child, but this is the girl that you know and that you see through your eyes. What made you pick up the pen and paper and start journaling and, and how you know, cathartic was that for you? You know, it was interesting because um, Stephanie's, uh, like I said, she was really motivated to survive because she wanted to have this child know her. Her biggest fear is that he'd grow up without her and never even know who she was. So as her father, I thought this is something I can do, something I can try and help with. So I started a journal the next day after we found the diagnosis. Steffi had a baby journal up until then and I just continued it. And um, I started trying to capture everything that we were going through because with an 8% chance of living, we just didn't know if this child was ever going to know her. So I wanted to make sure I tried to capture her essence and what we were going through, how hard she fought and uh, to live for him and for the family and, and for herself. And so it's interesting because once I started this journal, it, I started, it was a place for me to put down my emotions. It was a place for me to put down the things that were happening to us. And I had less things running around my mind and drive me crazy. So I found it to be very therapeutic and um, it was very helpful. And we talked about the journal often, you know, so I was able to capture the thoughts that were going on in Stephanie's head, as well as my wife and, and uh, her husband, Mark. Uh, we, we formed a team around her uh, to go ahead and fight this because, you know, if you take a look at someone standing up against a bully, there's nothing bigger than death as a bully. And to stand there alone and fight that is very difficult. So we formed a team around her. We called it a team of five. It was her, her, her husband, myself, my wife, and then the newborn baby. And you wouldn't think the baby would be much of a team member, but so often he was in the fact that he was the glue that kind of kept us together at times, as well as an escape. He was an oasis to us escape to and move away from all the drama and the fear and just deal with his new child. Sure, he's small but mighty, for sure. I want to read, Michael, something that you wrote in the book about a tough question that Stephanie had asked you. She asked me at some point, um, she said, Dad, am I going to die? What should a father say? With tears spilling from my eyes and my voice failing, I tell her the truth. Sweetheart, I don't know. You wrote those words, but what was it like hearing those from that daddy's girl? Um, terrifying, horrifying. It was uh, bringing all, all the worst fears forward that I could lose this child. And um, I wanted, you know, Steph and I are, are, are incredibly close. And we built that close relationship based on our honesty and our love for each other. And as much as I wanted to tell her, oh, this is gonna be fine, you're gonna be great, I had to tell her the truth that we just simply didn't know. And it was very difficult. It was a question, probably the hardest question I've ever answered. And it was a question that haunted me for a long time. Uh, in res retrospect, we both agree that I, I gave her the right answer that we just didn't know. Right, and that is cancer. It just, it's just a huge sea of unknowns at the time. You also wrote about needing to find a good oncologist, certainly part of that team. Um, you said you needed a champion. Uh, Stephanie and Michael, how did you end up finding this lady to my right here, Dr. Baranda? Uh, did you feel an immediate connection? What was that like? Well, uh, first of all, to find her, um, we had been, uh, an oncologist had been suggested to us and we uh, went and met with him and found that he was not a good fit at all. He was really talking down to us. He didn't want us to be part of the process. And so through that example, we found out what we weren't looking for. Um, I happened to be uh, a member of a pharmaceutical company and we had an oncology division, so I went ahead and tapped into that and talked to some of the local people as to who is a, an oncologist that's gonna be able to connect with my daughter, that's going to care for her as an individual, that's going to be cutting edge in their knowledge and uh, to be able to be all the perfect things that you would want out of your doctor uh, to help save your life. Someone that would be our champion, someone that would take us by the hand and lead us down the road. Do you have more to add? You know, um, my first appointment with Dr. Brandon was, I mean, I, I remember it clear as day. We were in this big room and um, there was a hospital bed and, and um, 
she walked in and she was like, well, what did they tell you about your liver? And I was like, well, they told me probably it wasn't cancer. And she's like, I think different. And I was like, okay. But yet at the same time, she was a mom, you know, she had, she had kids of her own. She understood what I was going through as a new mom and may have not understood the cancer part of it, but yet at the same time was like, I've been there. And she just took my hand and just led me down the right path. I mean, she was like, she was everything that I could have asked for. So. Well, let's bring her in. Dr. Branda, talk about that personal connection that you have with your patients and what was it like when you first met Steph? Yeah, um, it's a hard question to answer mm -hmm. because uh, I think it just happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the patient in your office, uh, you look at them across the room and uh, you know a lot of these patients have this news very fresh in their minds. Uh, um, very raw, mm -hmm. uh, and in, and uh, you can just imagine the terror that they're under, uh, that they could see, uh, and not knowing. Uh, just like what you asked Mike there, uh, how he answered Stephanie's uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, that's also the answer that we give patients sometimes. Is like we don't know, uh, but. Uh, that's why it's very important to actually keep uh, doing research uh, in cancer because we want to know the answers uh, to this question. Well, and it's kind of, I would imagine, playing that dance between being loving and caring and kind, but also doing your job as a, as a, as a clinician, correct, and finding that balance of being honest and upfront, yeah. but also caring. And in this case, you were bonding over motherhood, right? Yeah, but the, there's this big problem in front of you, yeah. uh, which is this life-threatening cancer that Stephanie has to deal with. And uh, we have to make sure that Stephanie knew that we're all in this together. Yeah, It's not just her journey, it's everybody, the nurses, everybody, uh, everybody the person who checks her in every, every time she comes in for chemotherapy. And making her feel confident that we're going to work and, and we're gonna tackle this the best we can. And in, in Stephanie's case, she had surgery to remove most of her colon. She needed chemo. She was also young. How does treatment for a younger patient differ from maybe somebody in their, in their 70s perhaps? Does that give her a, a, a better chance at, at having a better outcome through chemo? Yeah, so unfortunately there's increasing, um, there's a trend in increase in diagnosis of colon cancer in younger mm -hmm. individuals. And also uh, there's a trend in increasing diagnosis of advanced uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so um, patients uh, where, who are undergoing chemotherapy, we have to maximize everything we can to control the symptoms uh, from the cancer and symptoms from the chemotherapy. Although age can sometimes play a role, sometimes you cannot predict it because it's so individualized. There are some patients who uh, could tolerate the chemotherapy very well, mm -hmm. uh, even if uh, they are 70 years old. But there's also young individuals uh, that are like Stephanie, could get uh, significant toxicities uh, from the chemotherapy. So it just it just depends on the tolerability of the person. Uh, but the most important uh, predictor is actually how healthy or how functional the individual is. Age can matter, but it's it's your cytoplasm, how how strong the individual is. I mentioned at the top of the show, you are uh, uh, you head up the early phase program as it pertains to trials. Tell us what your job is as far as that goes and just the importance that trials played in this case. Yeah, I wanna go back to Stephanie's case before answering that. If Stephanie had the diagnosis of colon cancer in the 90s, I will be able to uh, give her only one drug. Mm -hmm. And we know that with one drug, the results are dismal in terms of uh, success in shrinking the cancer, even making it go away. I mean, that is very unheard of at that time. But in, in the mid uh, 90s and the early 2000s, there is this uh, uh, development of new therapies. And this is because of the research that has been done before those drugs have been approved. Now, early phase trial uh, are essentially phase one trials uh, where we use novel therapies. We're trying to develop novel, novel therapies. Historically, it takes a long time for a 
drug to be approved, sometimes close to 10 years. But nowadays, the way the trials are designed, the understanding, the deeper understanding that we have for cancer and identifying some of the targets for colorectal cancer actually had enabled us to do clinical trials and get some conclusions and have the some of these new drugs approved quicker out in the market. And I think Michael can probably uh, um, attest to that, him being in a pharmaceutical company before. Yeah, what were your thoughts of the trials and, and just knowing that had this diagnosis come, come much earlier that we wouldn't have what we have today, Michael? Well, I tell you what, I think we're always learning, and that's one of the things that really attracted us to Dr. Baranda. The first oncologist we talked to said he had a set algorithm for every patient. Dr. Baranda said, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to alter this because of your uh, health, because you're young, you're uh, healthy, and we're gonna be more aggressive to you because this is a very aggressive uh, cancer. And that's the things that we started noticing right away. Uh, the other oncologist was talking about, you know, coming in once every two weeks, doing it uh, slam bam, man, you know, an hour and a half. When we went to uh, Dr. Uh, Miranda, she put together a program that mixed in a lot of different other products to go ahead and reduce side effects, do it slower over a longer period of time to go ahead and take the patient comfort in. And so we really found that she was uh, someone that was cutting edge and that's what we needed. Uh, that's what everybody was telling us because of the type of cancer that she had and it was not seen very frequently that we needed something that was cutting edge and, and right on, on target and she definitely was. I wanna ask you about this. Eventually, uh, Stephanie's cancer was confirmed to be spread to her liver. You had mentioned that. And, and Steph and Michael, you, you headed to a specialist at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, first, just tell us what that was like. You took a bunch of road trips up there. What were doctors telling you? The first thing that uh, they told us, uh, the oncologist that we met with in uh, Mayo was, um, I will never be able to tell you that you're cured to Stephanie. No one had said that to us before, and it really kind of hit us very, very hard. But we found uh, a wonderful relationship with the oncologist there as well as Dr. Baranda because they knew each other. They, so they attended some symposiums together and that type of thing. But we found Mayo, Mayo to be um, a uh, second part of, uh, of Stephanie's dream team, I guess. And um, we made 17 trips up there and it was well worth the time and the effort because uh, we felt that we were getting the direction and the delivery and the uh, attention that we needed to go ahead and cover all of our bases. So Michael, talk to us a little bit about Stephanie's attitude through all of this, because attitude is everything, you know, that mind power, that positive thinking. Yes. What character did you see come out of her through all of this? Well, in the beginning, we were all victims, uh, every one of us was. And then uh, that first night especially, we were terrified. And, and I, I talked to Stephanie and, and I said, um, uh, as we talked about forming this team of five around her, I talked to her and said, tonight you can go ahead and get angry, you can throw things, you can scream, you can do anything, anything that you want because this isn't fair and this is happening to you and it's very personal. But tomorrow we need to start fighting. Uh, we had surgery the next morning, uh, scheduled for the next morning, and I said, so tomorrow you start becoming a, a fighter. And that's exactly what she did. And I'll tell you what, I, I could not believe how strong her attitude was, how, how strong her faith was, and the belief that she was going to overcome this. Now, when I would ask her uh, afterwards, you know, were you always that strong? She'd say, no. Dad lives a lot of times I was just hanging on by a thread. But we gained strength from her as much as she gained strength from us, if not more. Mm -hmm. She was incredibly strong. I don't believe that I could have done the same things that she did. She always took the most aggressive route, whether it be the oncology, whether it be the surgery. Uh, she just wanted to go ahead and fight this with everything that she had, and that's exactly what she did. So she was upbeat most of the time. She was positive. And um, the times that she wasn't, we held her up. And the times that we weren't, she held us up. Exactly. I want to see that picture of the team again. And then Dr. Baranda, just when we talk about support around a patient and um, the hope that they bring to the table, how important is that? 
Well, I think Stephanie is extremely lucky for having such an incredible um, uh, team around her, her family. You can really tell every visit uh, they are so engaged uh, with what's going on with Stephanie. So I'm, I, I was uh, very happy to see that, that Stephanie is one of uh, the patients who, you know, she's not, she wasn't alone. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you see patients with no but no one with them and that that's that's really sad but um that that's why we we're trying our very best to try to make sure that the care that we give is equitable and we make sure that this is for everybody that there's access uh, uh, available for everybody for uh, good quality cancer care as well as novel therapies through clinical trials okay can we just see baby Caden <laughs> you know little tiny baby Caden is now 17 years old if we could pull this picture this kid is darling Steph just tell us what it's like in those dark dark days where you're wondering if you were going to see these days and these milestones and, and here you are living it what's it like you know it's interesting because um at that time it was just you know, am I going to be able to see him go to kindergarten? Am I going to be able to see him get married? Am I going to be able to see him graduate high school? All of that stuff. But in those times, I had to really take it day by day. I couldn't look too far ahead. And I had to live every single moment as it was. And if that meant, hey, I get to walk with Caden around the pond today, or hey, I get to take Caden to a park today. One thing that came out of this was I was able to be home with Caden every single day of his life until he went to kindergarten. And so as scary as it was and not knowing what was going to happen, um, my faith just allowed me to believe that there's something out there bigger than me that's, that's taking care of this and I will be able to be there when he grows up. He's a junior in high school right now at Olathe East and next year he'll be graduating and it's just it blows my mind because these are the days that I didn't know if I would get. Um, but they're here and we're living every moment to the fullest because because of that. Um, so life is so good. It's so precious. And um, having him through there, you know, throughout my journey with me, you know, even as an infant, he gave me that strength that I have something besides just myself and my family to fight for. I need to be here to raise this baby. So. Yeah. Maybe not knowing what you were going to get at the end of this journey, maybe it wasn't a bad thing. Maybe it made you take those days little by little. So um, so that's really interesting. Hey, Michael, question to you. How did this, how did this journal then turn into the book? You, you know, you have this journal sacred between you and your family, but now it's here where you really, you can share the hope with, with so many people and families going through what you're going through. So how did it make the jump from your private journal to a book? Well, uh, as I said before, the journal was really about uh, something special to Caden. And um, the same uh, oncologist that said, I would never be able to tell you that you were cured, three and a half years later said, I believe you're cured. And he said, uh, and we, we couldn't even believe it. We couldn't even, uh, we walked out of that appointment and, and we all kind of shook our heads and said, what did he say? Did you guys hear that? But one of the other things that he mentioned, he knew that we, I was writing the journal. He knew that uh, we were a close family and I was recording all this. And he said, uh, do me a favor, make this story public. He said, uh, one of the biggest things my patients need that I have a difficult time uh, finding for them is hope. And uh, we felt that same way. When we first started fighting this, we didn't know what to do. And my wife was an RN, I was in a pharmaceutical company, worked with uh, people in medicine every day, and yet we were clueless uh, for a while. And we found our way slowly, so we hope that this book will go ahead and leave like a path that other people can follow, uh, because we learned an awful lot about it. And so that doctor uh, suggested that we make it into a book, and um, uh, it took us a while, Stephanie, once, uh, once she was cured and we felt better, um, then we started putting this together, and then I wrote it uh, multiple times to get it in the form that it is right now. That's a great legacy. And again, where can people find this book, Mike? You can uh, find it at any bookstore. can go ahead and order it. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, but most bookstores <laughs> will uh, order it or it may have it in stock already. Uh, it was published uh, last month. 
Um, it's getting incredible professional reviews, which I'm really mm -hmm. excited about because the only people that had read it was my friends and family, and they lied to me and told me it was good. And so <laughs> once I started some professional um, reviewers uh, getting their information out, it's, um, it's really gaining traction all over the United States, in fact, all over the world. Mike's memoir is called Daddy's Girl. Pick it up. Very helpful and very hopeful. Be sure to ask your questions to our panel today. Use the chat on YouTube, Facebook, or you could tweet us or email us at Medical News Network. Info is right there on your screen. Let's get a quick check on the COVID account with Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Good morning. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. Great very story. Very good. How are you? Right? <laughs> Isn't it great? I'm good. I love it. Yes. Yes. Right now, we also have good news uh, as far as the COVID count. You know, our counts have been down. Uh, we have 23 active cases, uh, sorry, 23 total, 12 active, four in the ICU and one on the ventilator. So continuing to push our active cases lower and lower, which is always good news. Always good news. We will wait till it goes to zero. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. we've seen a few headlines, Hawk, about COVID and pink eye, including one from the yeah. Washington Post. This headline says pink eye might, and we say might be a COVID symptom. Is, yeah. is there really any evidence of this? What does it mean? Does it matter? I think it's hard to say. I think this kind of harkens back to the, the early days of COVID where people were finding anecdotal, uh, meaning their own experiences, and then talking about them. This is one of those things. So the pink eye is just conjunctivitis. That's just irritation of, of the eyes there. It can be caused by several different things, including allergies, bacteria, and of course, viruses and a lot of viruses. And what we're hearing right now is that for a new variant, which they're looking at, Arcturus, is what it's called. It's an Omicron uh, sublineage again. So nothing uh, totally new. It's a, it seems to be a combination of a couple different other Omicron variants. Um, people are saying, well, maybe I'm getting some irritation in my eyes as well as fever when I have this virus. So it still needs to be investigated, but this is just kind of one more of those other symptoms that people are noticing. If you remember, one of the big anecdotal things that came up initially was loss of taste and smell. And we know that is a common symptom. So it still needs to be investigated. But again, there are other things that can cause that irritation of the eyes or pink eye. Yeah. All right, Hawk, thanks so much for that. Any reporters with us today? Thank you. All right, we've got a couple of questions that I want to get to from our community. Yen wants to know, could a pregnant woman undergo a colonoscopy, doctor? Uh, it depends on the urgency. Okay. Um, you, you know, uh, I it, I do want to stress that uh, because we're seeing younger uh, patients uh, diagnosed with uh, colorectal cancer, that they should not ignore the symptoms, like. Stephanie symptoms of blood in the stools or abdominal pain that's not going away. It just depends on, on the individual case. Well, and it's tricky because now you've got people in that those years of having yeah. children also being diagnosed sim uh, similar to Stephanie, so that, that can be tough. Ruth Ellen wants to know, is there, an, is there an experimental drug not approved that a doctor can suggest and a patient accept? Uh, not totally understanding the breadth of the question. Can you explain though where that line is when you're talking about like early phase trials and drugs yeah. and medications and where, what patients are able to accept with a doctor recommendation? Yeah, so uh, most of these drugs that are not approved by the FDA yet, they are available through clinical trials. Okay. Uh, there are however some drugs with very good signal and or, or however the patient is on a trial and is benefiting from that drug and the trial closed. Sometimes we're able to get these patients the access to these drugs. Uh, or something that uh, we have some good results that shows uh, that, that they could potentially help this patient, sometimes there's a way of getting an approval for that. And that's why you're so passionate about educating about trials and getting people enrolled. Let's get our takeaway today. And Dr. Baranda, I'm gonna start with you. What do you want folks to take away from our chat today? Uh, I think uh, the attitude that uh, Stephanie did, which is like uh, not accepting <laughs> um, and uh, just looking for the information there is very important. You have to ask, ask your doctor and look for more information. Yes. All right.
Michael, Stephanie, you got me a, maybe a little choked today because I see you two sitting there. It, it reminds me a lot of me and my dad. We're very close, Stephanie, so I understand. It's like you could be a parent, but when your parent is still living with you, it's you still feel like someone's kid, and there's just such a power behind that. So we just appreciate you sharing the story, and I just want to get the final takeaway. What do you want us to walk out of here with today? You know, I would say one thing is you have to listen to your body. Um, no matter what's going on, if it's, you know, like in my case, the, the bleeding and the pain and all of that stuff, I knew that wasn't right. And even though they kept telling me, oh, you're just, you're pregnant, like all pregnant women don't feel good, you know? And I knew deep down in my heart, I knew that it was colon cancer. There was no doubt in my mind. So when I got the diagnosis, yes, it was a shock, but I truly believe that I had colon cancer. Um, I just, you have to push you have to push through until you get the answers that you want. You have to find the right doctors. You have to do everything you can to be your own advocate. Well said. Mike, final takeaway today. Um, I guess what I would say is the, the biggest thing that Stephanie had going for her was her attitude and the fact that she never, ever gave up. And we ran into a lot of obstacles. We ran into a lot of challenges. And uh, I could not believe how strong our faith was. And so that would be something I hope this book uh, boosts people's faith and their hope. Because if you never, ever give up and you keep trying, it's amazing what you can accomplish. Thank you both. We appreciate you sharing today. Thanks to our viewers and your questions. We always appreciate those. Have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 8. To Alzheimer's, it contributes to all kinds of problems, but it's also a fundamental immune response meant to protect us. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Open Mics with Dr. Stites. New research is changing what doctors think about inflammation and what we should be eating. That's Wednesday at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.